This is your Monday Night Raw review for October 9th, 2023. I am the Solomonster. Still your undisputed WWE Tag Team Champions, Cody Rhodes and Jey Uso. They defended their titles tonight in the main event against Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens. Big tag team match. Just gave it away tonight in the main event. And we have our first match already made official. Or Crown Jewel, which is coming up in one month's time. They're going to be in Riyadh, I believe. Back in Saudi Arabia, and it will be Seth Rollins defending the World Heavyweight Championship against Drew McIntyre. We were wondering who it would be coming out of Fastlane, now that Shinsuke Nakamura lost two matches in a row to Seth Rollins. Who would be next in line for the title? Now we have our answer. And so that match has been made official. But we got to talk about this Raw show. Because Raw had, and, and has now for a few weeks, but it really was very noticeable tonight, that Raw has a very different feel to it. Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa last week at the end of the show reunited. After talking about it for so long, we finally had a DIY reunion last week when Johnny came out to save Ciampa. They're back together. Tegan Knox was challenging for the NXT Women's Championship on the show tonight. Zia Lee. When was the last time we saw Zia Lee on Raw or SmackDown? She finally found her way back to the building. She got lost, but she found her way back. She actually got television time tonight. You know who else got screen time on the show tonight? It was brief. Candice LeRae and Indy Hartwell. We saw a lot of faces that we are not really accustomed to seeing on this show very often. All of a sudden, they're popping up on Raw. And not only that, they have already announced a stacked card of matches for next Monday. This Friday is the season premiere of SmackDown. Next Monday is going to be the season premiere of Monday Night Raw. Well, what one has, the other one has to have also. Which would make tonight's episode the season finale. But they've already announced a whole bunch of matches next week. And how, when was the last time that we had Four or five different matches announced ahead of time, one week out from Monday Night Raw. Just looking at the lineup we have next week, it's going to be Cody Rhodes and Jey Uso defending their tag team titles in a rematch from Fastlane against the Judgment Day. We've got Gunther defending the Intercontinental title against Bronson Reed. Yes, that is taking place on Raw next Monday. We also have Rhea Ripley is going to go one-on-one -on -one with Shayna Baszler. That's going to be non-title. We've got Ricochet and Shinsuke Nakamura. They're going to be going one-on-one -on -one in a Falls Count Anywhere match. And they even threw Natty against Piper Niven on there. Five matches announced one week out for Monday Night Raw next week. And it honestly feels to me like August of last year all over again. When Triple H took the book and Triple H really started putting his stamp on Monday Night Raw and we started seeing faces popping up on this show that we had not seen before. There were people called up from NXT. The show just had a different feel to it. It's when I started reviewing Raw on a weekly basis. I had refused to do it up until that point. I will wait until Sunday. And then everything seemed to change last summer and I said, you know what, let's give this a shot. I'm going to give this show another shot. It's a fresh start for Monday Night Raw. 
And for a while there, it was pretty damn good. Until it wasn't. And then they started to fall back into old habits. Funny enough, around the time a certain someone decided to show his face again. But that's what this kind of feels like to me. It gives me that vibe of August of 2022. Where I really started to have hope. For Monday Night Raw. And it feels like Triple H is starting to flex his creative muscles again. And if it feels that way, it's for good reason, because he is flexing his muscles again. There was a report earlier today from Mike Johnson of PWInsider.com. And Mike is very reliable when it comes to the things that he hears and the news that he reports. And in his audio update on PW Insider, this is what he had to say. He said, there is a belief within the company that Triple H has been basically knighted by Endeavor. And that he is the one who is driving 99% of the creative going forward, not Vince McMahon. Now, I want to show you this. Rare it is right there. There's Ari Emanuel. This is my crude artwork 30 minutes before Raw went off the air tonight. So well, you'll have to excuse me, but there, Ari Emanuel, knighting Triple H. You know, I didn't do a bad job, actually. Knighting Triple H. He has been knighted by Endeavor. And Johnson said that he feels, and this is his opinion now, like there will be a tug of war, and sometimes Vince McMahon will give his thoughts, and they'll go with what Vince wants. But I'm told that week to week, in the weeds, they are going with what Triple H wants. Later on in the day, per Fightful, one WWE higher-up told Sean Ross Sapp, I think you can take a look at the show. Johnny Gargano is back after his return was nixed. Tegan Knox is on the show. Dragon Lee is all over the program. Carlito is finally factored in after being under contract for months. Cameron Grimes got back on TV. Bronson Reed is winning matches. Tag team titles and IC titles are getting long matches to end Raw. I'm not going to say that all of those are direct results of the situation, but all of those parts moving at the same time is a little too much to be a coincidence for me. That's a great point. How do you look at what's going on here? How do you look at all these faces that we are seeing on this show and not come to the conclusion that something is changing? Or something recently has changed. So again, you don't. Yeah, you know, there are times where you don't need to read a dirt sheet report or a newsletter. You don't need to read something to know that something's going on. Just watch the show. The show just had a different vibe to it tonight. And I thought that this was one of the best Raws all year. This was one of the better episodes all year in 2023 of Monday Night Raw. So clearly. There is a shift that has happened here. Now, the question is, can it be sustained, right? We're, we're only in the beginnings of this, right? According to Mike Johnson, it's going forward. Triple H is going to have you know 99% creative control over what we see on television. Excuse me if I take a wait-and-see approach. I'll believe it when I see it. This is a great sign. Not everything on the show is going to click right away. Johnny Gargano is not suddenly over to the mass audience. Tegan Knox is not suddenly over to the mass audience. She wrestled Becky Lynch tonight, mostly to crickets. But why would you expect anything else? What has Tegan Knox done on television recently? Nothing. And this is the point that I've been making, especially when it comes to a lot of the women who sit in catering and they don't get opportunities to be on the main show. Maybe they'll be on main event. It's the self-fulfilling prophecy where it's like, well, they're not over. How do you get over if you're not on the show? If you're not given the chance to get over, how do you get over? You've got to put them on TV. You've got to let them sink or swim. You've got to give them a chance. Let them be exposed to the audience. Let people know who they are. This is the beginning process of that. I can't tell you right now if Tegan Knox is going to go on to become a big star. I don't know. I can't, I can't tell you that Zia Lee is going to be a success story on the main roster. Right now, she has been a failure, and it's not her fault. She's not being given the opportunity. So as they start to rotate more of these faces into the show, we'll see how well they do. But at least give them the chance. Triple H is willing to give them the chance. 
And that's the way that it should be. Otherwise, what the hell are these people doing under contract on the roster sitting in the back? But again, so long as Vince McMahon is still there, he's always going to be poking his head into things. But for now, it's nice to see Triple H getting more freedom to do his thing. The other thing I wanted to talk about here before we get into the review, I don't know how many of you were paying attention to this today on social media, but tomorrow is our little Tuesday Night War. It's going to be NXT all loaded for bear, head-to-head -head on USA Network against AEW Dynamite on TBS. Dynamite is being bumped up by a day this week because of the MLB playoffs. And so we have our head-to-head -head battle between the two shows. And I said over the weekend on the podcast that, like, I think this is great, right? I'm having fun with this. They Both both of them are loading up the show. Shawn Michaels loading up the show. Tony Khan loading up the show. NXT, I mean, it's ridiculous. You got John Cena is going to be in Carmelo Hayes' corner against Braun Breaker, who's going to have Paul Heyman. Cody Rhodes is going to be on the show to make a major announcement. Asuka is wrestling on the show. Becky Lynch will probably be on the show. Rhea and Dominic may well be on the show. They're teasing The Undertaker might be on the show. So they are loading up NXT tomorrow night. And for his part, Tony Khan has put together a very strong lineup as far as matches on Dynamite. Brian Danielson and Swerve Strickland, Chris Jericho and Powerhouse Hobbs, Jay White and Hangman Page, a bunch of other matches. I don't even remember half the card that Tony Khan has put together for tomorrow night. But then earlier today, before Raw, a few hours before Raw, the NXT account tweeted this out. This was breaking news at 3.30 this afternoon. The first 30 minutes of NXT tomorrow night will be commercial free. I was wondering if they were going to pull this card. So there it is. The first half hour of NXT tomorrow night is going to be commercial free. Well, fast forward a little bit later on, during Raw this evening, there was another tweet that went up. This one from Tony Khan at 9.41 p.m. The first 30 minutes of Title Tuesday, AEW Dynamite, will be commercial free on TBS tomorrow night. Remember, AEW Dynamite is in a special time slot tomorrow, one week only, Title Tuesday on TBS. First 30 minutes, commercial free. See, this is what happens when you have competition. This is what happens when you have competition. They're trying to one-up each other here. But I love the follow-up tweet from Tony, <laughs> from Tony Khan. In case you were wondering, why would AEW all of a sudden announce 30 minutes, commercial free? Well, I mean, it should be pretty obvious, obviously. This was his follow-up tweet here. Hat tip for the uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm meme. Okay, you want to be a dick. <laughs> this is what happens. I could just see Tony Khan. He sees that NXT tweet go out earlier. He's on the phone to the executives at Warner saying, give me 30 minutes. You messed up my audio last week. Give me 30 minutes. So now he's got 30 minutes commercial free at the beginning of Dynamite tomorrow night. But wait, that's not all. There was one more tweet 20 minutes before Raw, so an hour after this, Tony Khan posted another tweet. This one was at 10.41 p.m., exactly one hour later, before a huge dynamite tomorrow night, the buy-in at 7.30 Eastern. Yes, Tony Khan has added a buy-in pre-show for dynamite tomorrow on all social media platforms, and he has added another match. Eddie Kingston is going to wrestle Minoru Suzuki. <laughs> You're shitting me. I saw this. I said, wait a minute. Getting the jump on House of Glory. We got Suzuki on Friday. I'm calling a, I'm calling a Suzuki match on Friday night. That's why I won't be here for SmackDown. This guy better not get hurt tomorrow. We might lose our main event. But that's why Suzuki's he's in the States. He's in town. Because he's, he's going to be... Uh, in New York on Friday. But there it is. Eddie Kingston and Minoru Suzuki on the buy-in. Unbelievable. 
And look, there's still look, there's still a little less than 24 hours left. So they could add even more. We might get even more stuff added to these shows tomorrow. I'm very curious what they decide. Midday, we'll get some kind of announcement from NXT. They're going to add like a Hell in a Cell match or something at the Performance Center. Tony Khan then is going to jump on uh, social media. He's going to add a freaking stadium stampede. I'm loving this. I don't see why how anybody could have a problem with this. It's getting petty. I like it when it gets petty. It's more fun for everybody when things get petty. So there you go. It's going to be a big night tomorrow night. Big enough that the plan right now for the, I know people were asking, the plan right now is to cover both shows. I'm going to try to watch both shows simultaneously. We'll have one big Super Tuesday review here on the channel tomorrow night. So wish me luck. That is the current plan. It's going to be a fun night. But first, we got to talk about this night here. Again, this is your Monday Night Raw review. I am the Solid Monster. Please hit that like button. Subscribe as well. 400 likes, by the way, is the goal for our Be the Booker segment that we usually do at the end of the stream. So we hit at least uh, 400 likes. We will try to book some random matches a little bit later on. Super chats are open. Get them on in. Thank you for your support in advance of the channel. I do appreciate all the super chat love. It does help out. It does mean a lot. So thank you. All right. So let's get to Raw here. Raw opened with the World Heavyweight Champion Seth Rollins coming down to the ring. This is after his win over Shinsuke Nakamura in the last man standing match. You want, to, you want to take bets on ratings? We have people talking about ratings in the chat. We should do that. We should do that. So either in the live chat or super chat, if you have a guess as to what you think each show will do in the Nielsen numbers tomorrow night. Because to me, I think it's, it's probably an easy win for NXT. I don't think it's so much a debate about who's going to win the night. But what do you think the numbers will be for each show? Let me know what you guys think. I'll, maybe I'll give you my prediction later. So Rollins is in the ring, and he said that Nakamura took him to his limited fast lane. He said there were times during the match that he didn't know if he could get back up or keep Nakamura down, but he did. He said that he felt like he was on top of the world after he won the match. And then he went backstage, and he was reminded, once the adrenaline wore off, that he does still have a broken back. Then he turned very serious here. Stop being goofy and happy and laughing. And he got serious and he said that being the world heavyweight champion is one of the great honors of his career. And just the tone of his voice and the way he was acting here, it was like he wanted you to believe that he was about to make an announcement that he was going to relinquish the title. I think that's the vibe they were going for here. And the fans started a thank you Rollins chant. He said, but I want you to know that I'm just getting started, baby. And he started laughing. He said he wants to sing and dance and throw back a few cold Look, ones everyone, instead of fighting for his Samoa life. Bro. Just for one week, he would like to come to Monday Night Raw and not have to fight for his life. Lady Fire Panda, thank you for that Samoa, bro. Drew McIntyre's music interrupted. And he sarcastically came down to the ring and he sarcastically looked up and he waved at Rollins, waved hello. He got into the ring. Seth asked him, you're not out here to party, are you? And Nakamura, and, uh, Nakamura. McIntyre shook his head no. He said, you want a world heavyweight title match, don't you? And McIntyre shook his head yes. Rollins said he just wanted one night, just one night, and then he got worked up. And he talked about being a fighting champion, so he was ready to go to the back and get ready, and he, he was going to give him a title match. McIntyre said, oh, hold on a second here. He goes, the party is still on. He said, others might jump you from behind. I'm looking at you in the eye, and I'm telling you I want a world heavyweight title match. But he wants him as close to 100% as possible. So he was thinking, Seth Rollins, one-on-one -on -one with Drew McIntyre at Crown Jewel. Rollins was puzzled by this, that McIntyre was not here to jump him from behind like everybody else. This is not something that he's used to. He said that he was going to need some help with this. He goes, Omaha, I've got a question for you. Crown Jewel, world heavyweight title on the line. Seth Rollins against Drew McIntyre. What do you think? And They all cheered, and Seth told him he's got his match. So Drew went to go leave, and Rollins 
stopped him or tried to stop him and told him, wait, 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 the party is just getting started here. Because uh, you used to be in a band, which is true. He used to be in a three-man band. McIntyre told him, look, I've got business to take care of in the back, but he told Omaha, if they see him out on the streets tonight, make sure you buy him a pint and a shot. McIntyre left, and Rollins is in the ring by himself. He's got his back turned, and all of a sudden, Damian Priest ambushes him from behind. Gave him the South of Heaven choke slam, and he starts waving to the back. He's, he's motioning for somebody to come out from the back. And here comes Dominic Mysterio. He's got the money in the bank briefcase. And McIntyre is still in the aisle, so he didn't lift a finger to go back to the ring to help Seth. But as soon as Dominic is almost past him, he puts his arm out to stop him from coming to the ring. Dominic is like, what are you doing? He's cashing in money in the bank. McIntyre gives him a headbutt. He picks up the briefcase. He chucks the briefcase so hard it hits the LED screens. It falls. It breaks open. And embarrassingly, there is nothing inside. <laughs> There's no contract. There is nothing inside this briefcase. Rollins came back. He knocked Priest out of the ring, so there was no cash-in. You know, maybe if Priest had brought the briefcase out to the ring with him, he could have cashed in his money in the bank. But as we saw at Fastlane, Rhea Ripley took it away from him, sent him to his room, punished him, said no video games anymore. She's the one who leads the Judgment Day, so she calls the shots. So he didn't. he was not in possession of the briefcase. So Rollins and McIntyre are official now. The match is official for Crown Jewel. And I'm thinking we'll probably get a tag team match at some point between now and then. Rollins and McIntyre against the Judgment Day. Uh, I'm sure there'll be more twists and turns with the storyline on television between now and then. You know, it was looking there for a while like we were going in the direction of Cody and Drew. And I don't know if they've completely dropped that angle or not. It felt like when Cody won the tag titles the other night with Jay, it just felt like maybe plans changed and they decided to take this story in a different direction. So now there's nothing, there's been no interaction, there's been no further uh, words exchanged between Cody and Drew. We had that one week where Drew did not lift a hand to help, might have been Owens and Zayn, and then Sam and Cody came out instead. McIntyre gave him a look. So again, it felt like we were going in that direction of Cody and Drew, and then maybe, again, they, they've kind of pivoted to a different plan here. So that may have changed. We had Kofi Kingston, one-on-one -on -one with Ivar. This was a Viking rules match. False count anywhere. They had Viking shields lining all four sides of the ring on the apron. Their last match on Raw three weeks ago was very good. Uh, very good match. This one was a lot of fun, too. Kofi did a suicide dive out over the top rope in the first 30 seconds that nearly resulted in a suicide. He landed, it looked like he landed on his head, and they showed the replay, and he was able to kind of land more on his shoulder, but it was a very scary landing. After a break, Kingston had Ivar on the middle rope with uh, one of those Viking, they had Viking flags in each of the four corners, like it was a flag match. So you come back from break, He's got Ivar on the middle rope, but he's got one of those Viking flags like over his throat, falls backwards, and hits a Russian leg sweep. Although Ivar sort of landed on top of him, so I'm not sure Kofi didn't get the worst of that. Kingston came back. He hit an SOS for two. Ivar hit a sit-out powerbomb and got a two-count of his own. There was another spot where Ivar is on the top rope and Kofi is on the apron. And Kofi reaches up and he grabs him by his beard. And he yanks him forward, and Ivar takes this huge bump out, out of the ring over the top rope through a table on the floor. And that got a big reaction. All of a sudden, Valhalla showed up. She ran in through the crowd. She jumped on top of Kofi. So that brings out Xavier Woods. And Xavier Woods comes down to the ring. He circles around because all of this is going on in the area where the announce table is. So he comes down, and... Of course, he can't do anything, because in WWE, no matter what the women do to you, you can't lay a finger on them. So all he does is stand there like an idiot. She decides to charge at him. He ducks the charge. Valhalla goes flying over the barricade by the timekeeper's area. 
So now Woods is sitting on the ground up against the barricade. He's laughing. He's smiling, right, thinking he's outsmarted her. What he doesn't realize is here comes Ivar with a running crossbody, and Ivar squishes him up against the barricade. In the ring, Kingston tried for a trouble in paradise. Ivar, though, caught him and gave him a running power slam through a table that had been set up in the corner. And then Ivar finished things off with a huge moonsault off the top rope, landed right across Kofi's face, it looked like, and he pinned him to win the match. Their first match was better as an actual match. This was, yeah, this was like the hardcore match. They had weapons and all sorts of toys to play with here. Uh, but this was a lot of fun, too. This is also very good. I just thought their first match was stronger. I don't know what the injury is, but Eric is out. He either had surgery or he is about to have surgery, and he's going to be out for about six months. So this is Ivar's chance to break out on his own, at least for a while, and get a singles run for himself. And so far, it's been a few weeks, he's doing a hell of a job. Every time I've seen him in the ring so far, he's very, he's impressed, right? And that moonsault gets over like crazy because, again, you don't expect to see a guy that big hitting really what looks like a great-looking moonsault. You know, Vader, Vader is the first, like, super heavyweight that I can remember seeing as a fan who I watch go up to the top rope and hit a moonsault. Vader did not hit what I would call a picture-perfect moonsault, right? But Vader didn't have to hit a picture-perfect moonsault. It wouldn't have made sense for it to be picture-perfect. Ivar, Look, though, everyone, it's Samoa Bro. Great form, right? Devastating move. Finished off Kofi Kingston here, former WWE champion. So Ivar is getting to push right now. I don't know how long it's going to last. He's going to, so far, he's taking full advantage of it. Uh, these two work really well together. It's not really that surprising. Kofi got his start, uh, I don't know if it's in Massachusetts or in Maryland before uh, chaotic wrestling. So around 2006, they were both there together. I think Ivar was actually teaching uh, classes there. And so Kofi may have been one of the people he was training. And I know they worked together at least once. There's footage of them. You know, I think it was for Chaotic. It's an independent match they were having. So their history together goes back a long way. And in fact, when WWE came in to recruit, I think Kofi Kingston was the only one that they took from the class there. That's when he signed with WWE. So there's history between them. Clearly, they work very well together and uh, wouldn't mind seeing more of it. But again, the Ivar push so far gets a thumbs up from me. Backstage, Byron Saxton was with Shinsuke Nakamura. He was asking him questions, trying to get him to comment on his match at Fastlane. Nakamura didn't really have a whole lot to say. He just sort of stared at him. And then Ricochet busted in. He attacked Nakamura. And they had to be separated by officials. We'll circle back around to this later. This was a very stupid thing for Ricochet to do. After a commercial, the first shot that we see, Damian Priest has J.D. McDonough by the throat up against the wall. And Rhea Ripley and Finn Balor are there to try to save McDonough's life. McDonough was about to say something. Balor cut him off and said, shut up. He told McDonough, you caused enough trouble this week. I've had enough of you. Priest was wondering, hey, where were you guys? Talking to Balor and Rhea now. Where were you? After what happened in the opening segment. Ripley said we were with Adam Pierce, And uh, we got the judgment, or she got the judgment day. A rematch next week on Raw for the tag team titles. Priest was cool with that. Still, though, he wanted to deal with McDonough and McIntyre. Ripley told him, don't worry about McIntyre because uh, he didn't need to worry about him as long as he had that money in the bank contract. Rhea then got in McDonough's face. By the way, Rhea was wearing, for those who care about this sort of thing, Rhea Ripley was wearing pigtails on this show. I saw half of Twitter was ablaze with comments about Rhea Ripley's hair and her pigtails. You can imagine. You can imagine the comments. She was looking very good. But she got up in McDonough's face and told them that you're going to have to prove yourself tonight in the ring against Drew McIntyre. And Priest admitted uh, he felt like taking care of McDonough himself after McIntyre breaks him in half, but he told McDonough to get the job done tonight, and he wished him luck. And that took us into Nia Jax and Raquel Rodriguez. So how is it that 
when this Raw was over, I thought that this was one of the best Raws of the year, and it had a Nia Jax match on the show. Because they kept it relatively short. This went maybe six or seven minutes. There was nothing really offensive about it. Nobody got killed. I call that a good night for Nia Jax. Raquel put Jax down with a big boot. She tried to follow up by picking her up on her shoulders, but she collapsed under the weight of Nia Jax. Nia dragged Raquel to the corner. She was setting up for her bonsai drop finish. She calls it the Annihilator. Raquel, though, she slipped under Jax and got her in a powerbomb position, and she ended up giving her a powerbomb, which popped the crowd. Rhea Ripley then ran out. She threw Raquel out of the ring to end the match. I, I have to assume that it was a no contest. I don't think they actually announced what it was, but I'm going to assume no contest. So Ripley went after Nia, and Raquel came back in. She roughed up Rhea. Rhea dropped her with a headbutt. Now here comes Shayna Baszler. She charges into the ring. She attacks Nia Jax. So Ripley yells at Baszler. Baszler takes her down with a German suplex and then drills her with a knee to the face. I have seen far worse from Nia Jax. I was not expecting a clean finish anyway. Rhea was already teasing that she was probably going to come out during this match. So the fact that we didn't get a finish didn't surprise me. This felt like it was setting up a four-way match. Now we're getting Rhea and Baszler on television next week. My guess would be at... Crown Jewel, we're getting a four-way for the championship. It'll be Rhea, it'll be Nia, it'll be Raquel, and it'll be Shayna. So we'll see if they uh, take steps next week to set that up. And honestly, you know, Nia as one of four women in the match instead of it being a singles match. You know, I thought maybe they were building Rhea and Nia for the championship. Uh, probably a better idea to make it a four-way. So Drew McIntyre was in the back. Seth Rollins walks up to him. And he says that he talked to Adam Pearce, and so the match between them is official for Crown Jewel. It will be for the World Heavyweight Championship. But he wants to know, what, what, what's your problem? Because he didn't stop the attack on him earlier when Priest came out. But yet, he goes and he acts like a hero. When he blocks Dominic from coming out to give him the money in the bank briefcase to cash in. And Drew says, look, I have not told a single lie so far. He goes, I said it last time. I am not getting involved with anything that doesn't involve me. And honestly, that's a good rule to live by. <laughs> when you get involved in other people's business, usually shit goes sideways. So probably best to just mind your own business. See, Drew McIntyre has the right idea. Start trying to help other people out, then you get screwed. So he's like, I've made it very clear. If it doesn't involve me, I don't get involved. Priest cashing in, though, that would have affected my business. He says he doesn't want a Bloodline sequel on Raw with the Judgment Day, where they win the World Heavyweight title and then they hold it hostage for three years like Roman Reigns. Seth says the Judgment Day can't take the title from him, and neither can Drew. You know, it, it, it does feel to me like... And I, 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 we think of Roman Reigns, but I'm also thinking of someone who's wrestling on dynamite. Tomorrow. <laughs> Daniel Malcolm. Perfectly timed. Oh, you were a little off. But almost perfectly timed with Nia's hole. Thank you for the 15 bucks. But what I was going to say is we're in this, it feels like we're in this period now. Where we have Roman Reigns. He's been champion for three years. They love to say Roman Reigns has been champion for 1,150 days. And like it's some impressive statistic when he defends the title, you know, five times a year. But we have something going on right now in AEW. It's not as, not as long as the reign that Roman has had. She just won the title not that long ago. But Soraya is defending her title against Hikaru Shida tomorrow night on Dynamite. Have we even seen this woman more than once since she won the title at Wembley Stadium? I mean, it's pretty transparent why she won the championship, but it's exactly the reason why I didn't want her to win the title in the first place. Because she doesn't wrestle. Why are you going to put the title on somebody who does not wrestle full time? She has a match every now and then. Let's put the world title on her. So, of course, she's done basically nothing since Wembley. But the longer she keeps this title, I swear, if I hear Excalibur on commentary talking about how Saray has been champion for 75 days, 100 days, I'm going to pull my hair out. Who cares? 
Nobody cares. It's not impressive. This, this idea of counting the days when somebody is champion, when they're never even around, they never even defend the title. Where, where did this start? I don't want this to become an epidemic thing where this becomes like the norm. But I was looking at that lineup for Dynamite tomorrow night, and I was thinking about Soraya. I'm like, what the hell? I, for, I almost forgot she was even the champion. Ridiculous. Michael Cole held court in the ring for a special interview. He was bringing out the new Undisputed Tag Team Champions. Jey Uso was out first, right? There you go. That's, that's, his, that's his thing that he does now. He was sober, I think. And then he introduced Cody Rhodes. If you did not see, by the way, the uh, portion of the media scrum after Fastlane the other night, WWE put the entire portion with Cody Rhodes and Jey Uso on their YouTube channel. And I think it says full, but it's not full. There was at least one part you could tell where they, they there was like a jump cut. Uh, I think Jay may have dropped an f bomb. I don't know. I don't remember exactly what he said. Obviously, though, they edited something out of it. Uh, but the rest of it is there. It's actually highly entertaining if you haven't seen it. So you could just go on their YouTube channel. They have the whole thing there. So Cole asked them uh, how it felt to be champions. He said Jay is now a two-time. Undisputed Tag Team Champion, or Jay said that, not Cole. He said that he's now a two-time Undisputed Tag Team Champion. He was very excited. He said, Cody Rhodes is my partner. He's my oos. He's my oos. He was very excited that Cody Rhodes is his partner. See, I said he was sober. He may not have been. Michael Cole then recalled Cody bringing Jay back to WWE. He was the one responsible for bringing Jay back when he walked out. And he said, here they are now, champions, less than two months later. That's right. And do you know the last time that Cody Rhodes was a tag team champion in WWE? It was almost a decade ago. And he teamed with his brother, and do you know who they beat to win the tag team titles? Jimmy and Jey Uso. Time is a circle. So Cole asked Cody what defending the tag titles does to his original goal when he came back to WWE of Finishing the story. Cole said that everybody has watched his documentary. He said that he and Cody have had long conversations themselves, very personal conversations, about Cody finishing the story. And he asked if Cody was content with this and whether he's afraid of trying again because he failed the first time around. Look at Michael Cole here. Michael Cole growing a spine and actually asking the tough questions here in this interview. You mean to tell me that my, how come Michael Cole didn't come out here and ask Cody Rhodes uh, what it would be like to be tag team partners with Taylor Swift? These, these hard hitting questions that we get in these WWE media scrums. They could use Michael Cole in one of these scrums. They should just put him in the audience. Let him ask all the questions. Cause he was being a total dick to Cody here in this segment, but I liked it. Cody started by talking about his excitement for being in a tag team. Uh, with Jay being tag team champion. And Cole said, yeah, yeah, that's great and all. But he pushed him to answer whether his story would be only coming close to winning the WWE Championship, not actually winning the WWE Championship, like his father. I told you, Cole was being a dick here in this segment. Cody was about to answer before he could say anything, though. Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, they made their entrance to Sammy's old heel theme song. And, and Sammy looked confused when he walked out. He was probably as confused as most of us were hearing the old music. And the first thing he did, first thing he said when he got into the ring was, okay, haven't heard that song for a minute. So the, uh, the music man botched the song. He's going to have to label that version a little bit differently next time to make sure that, you know, he hits the right one. Although when Sammy came out later in the show for his match, he did have his regular babyface theme. So anybody wondering, I know some people were like, oh, is this a sign? You know, Owens and Zayn are going to go heel. No. The music guy pushed the wrong button. It's as simple as that. So Sammy recalled uh, Jimmy and Jay holding the undisputed tag team titles longer than anyone in history, only to lose them to him and KO in the main event of this year's WrestleMania. He also noted that Cody and Jay beat the Judgment Day, and he said that he was here to sincerely congratulate the two of them. And Sammy said that he had to admit there were mixed emotions involved. 
here. He said that he couldn't help but feel that he and Kevin Owens should be holding those tag team titles. Owens then chimed in. He said uh, he didn't have mixed emotions. He said that he's not happy to see Cody and Jay holding the belts. He said he wants those belts back. And he would like to look them both in the eye and challenge them to a tag team title match. But he said he knew that if he did, they would not accept because Jay cannot handle losing the titles to him and Sammy twice. Jay was ready to throw down. Cody held him back and said, look, we're all friends here, or at least I thought we were. And Owens was wrong because they do accept their challenge to a tag team title match tonight on Raw. And Cody offered a handshake, which Zayn accepted. Owens was already gone by then. It was nice to see a WWE interviewer actually grilling someone, asking, you know, a legitimate kind of hard-hitting question here. Instead of the usual, just completely empty questions that we get, they just, they force them to ask the most basic, stupid questions that have the most basic, stupid answer to them. And they all just sound like just robots. It was nice that Michael Cole, you know, was in the ring and they had him pushing back on Cody and asking him a legitimate question, which we never got a legitimate answer to uh, because he got cut off. Um, but keep in mind, they are not ignoring the story. They are actually incorporating it into the storyline here. They're drawing attention to it. For anybody wondering what Cody's status is going into WrestleMania next year, oh, maybe he's not going to face Roman Reigns. That is the match. That is the match at WrestleMania 40. It is Roman Reigns. It is Cody Rhodes for the Undisputed Championship. That was going to be the match a few months ago. When they had Brock Lesnar put Cody over and Brock stood in the ring at SummerSlam and endorsed him and raised his arm. And, and how many people does Brock do that for? He put his stamp on Cody Rhodes at SummerSlam. And it's still the match. People clinging to the, the, the idea that Rock and Roman, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen anyway. But once the actor strike is over, it's definitely not going to happen. John Cena actually did a very good job at that media scrum of explaining why. Uh, when he was asked, he goes, yeah, as soon as the strike's over, I'm going back to work. You know, there's, there's insurance issues, there's liability issues, there's people relying on me. He goes, I'm going back to work. So, the main event of WrestleMania 40 is Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes for the undisputed title. And Cody will finish the story of WrestleMania. We had Ricochet, Bronson Reed, and Chad Gable. Triple threat match. The winner of this match... Cody just finished the tag team chapter of his story. That's right. It's like video game mode. Now he's got to win the Intercontinental, and then he can win the World Heavyweight Championship. But we had Ricochet, Bronson Reed, and Chad Gable, triple threat. Winner gets an Intercontinental title match against Gunther on Raw next Monday night. And I said, ooh, that got my attention. I perked up at that point. I said, okay, this, this is going to be good. Ricochet was about to make his entrance but he was attacked from behind by Shinsuke Nakamura. And Nakamura picked Ricochet up on his shoulders and he delivered a GTS. And then he gave him a Kinshasa, or he was setting up for the Kinshasa, but officials ran out to stop him. A GTS, you say? As if anybody was doubting that they're messing with us, they're messing with us. I was just talking about all the punk references over the last few weeks. Usually they involve Seth Rollins. Now we have a GTS. From Shinsuke Nakamura. Yes, and it was ugly. It was not the best looking GTS, but they are clearly just messing with us right now. So after a break, Ricochet was in the ring and he was selling the attack, but he was waiting for his opponents to make their way out. Wade Barrett said that it was his own fault for attacking Nakamura earlier in the show. He said that it was terrible match preparation, and he is absolutely right. What did he expect was going to happen? He attacked Nakamura. Did he expect Nakamura to not come out and give him the same treatment and reciprocate? Stupid. He got what he had coming. Bronson Reed sent both men out to the floor. He went for a move from the apron to the floor, but Ricochet caught him with a knee to the face. Chad Gable grabbed Ricochet. He was going to give him a uh, suplex. He was trying to give him a German. And Ricochet was fighting it, so then he turned it into a full Nelson suplex onto Reed, who was laid out on the floor. After a commercial, Bronson scooped up both guys and gave them a double Samoan drop. 
Later on, Gable actually got Bronson Reed up and over for a German, like a delayed German suplex, which was unbelievable. I, I just, again, Chad Gable, the core strength that it takes to pull off a move like that, because Bronson Reed's a big boy. Chad Gable, relative to Bronson Reed, is not. So the visual of him slowly picking this big guy up and slamming him down over his head was very impressive. Gable put Ricochet in an ankle lock. Ricochet, though, slipped out, and he hit a knee strike. Gable tried to release German suplex off the top rope, but Ricochet landed on his feet. But upon landing on his feet, he sold that he had tweaked his knee. And so Gable came up from behind him. He hit the chaos theory. But as soon as Gable dumped him over with the uh, delayed German, on the chaos theory. Bronson Reed was right there. He reached down. He scooped up Ricochet. He dumped him on top of Gable. And then he hit a running senton onto both men. Then he dragged Ricochet over to the corner. He went up top. And he hit the tsunami splash for the win. Yes. Yes. Those last couple of minutes of this match were excellent. I thought that finishing sequence was fantastic. This was a lot of fun. Very good triple threat. Ricochet wasn't winning. First of all, we've already seen Gunther and Ricochet a whole bunch of times. Ricochet was not winning because obviously he's got an issue now with Shinsuke Nakamura. And Chad Gable was not winning either because Chad Gable's story is going to play out in a few months. Could be the Royal Rumble. It could be WrestleMania. They will come back to Chad Gable. And I still firmly believe that Chad Gable will be the one to dethrone Gunther. But not now. So by process of elimination... It looked like this was going to be the night for Bronson Reed, uh, and it was. So now we get Gunther and Bronson Reed next week. I would say take my money, and it's not even a pay-per-view. That is going to be a fantastic battle. Uh, it is nice to have a champion defending his title on a regular basis here on television, and not only defending his championship, but having kick-ass matches in the process. Why I say Gunther is the best champion in this entire company. WWE, NXT, Raw, SmackDown. He is the best champion in this company right now. Has been for a while. It's a very valuable part of that show. People pay attention to his matches. His matches feel like a big deal. Because you're all waiting. You're waiting to see who's going to be the one to dethrone this guy. But there's really nobody like him. Just the way that he, he wrestles and he's unique. Yeah, I'm not saying he's the most charismatic, but he is a unique character on the show. And when the bell rings and it comes time to work, nobody puts the work in like he does. I mean, his matches are fantastic. It doesn't matter who he's in the ring with, no matter how big or small they may be. This is a little bit different because we've seen him in the ring with people like Gable and Champa, uh, but we've also seen him in the ring with people like Sheamus and Drew McIntyre. Every single time he goes out there, Gunther has excellent matches. Bronson Reed has been. On a roll. He is a Triple H guy. It is no surprise that if Triple H is now being given more creative leeway and creative latitude here to be able to push the people that he wants to push, that Bronson Reed is going to Raw next week to challenge for the Intercontinental Championship. That should be a surprise to no one. That, to me, is a must-see match. Do I expect a title change? Absolutely not. But it is a fresh match that we have not seen before. It's the battle between two big guys. I know some people love that. But that is going to be a match I'm very much looking forward to seeing next week. In the backstage, Jackie Redman interviewed the NXT Women's Champion, Becky Lynch. Asked her about her health. Becky said she's not 100%. She still has 11 stitches in her arm. She worked in a plug for her book. For those who don't know, she has a book coming out in March of next year. So uh, get ready for... A lot of plugging between now and then. She's uh, plugging her book, even on this show tonight. Tegan Knox is her opponent. She said that she's going to be like a wounded bear in the ring against Tegan. All of a sudden, Zia Lee walks up to Becky Lynch. Do you remember Zia Lee? It's okay if you don't. I don't blame you. We don't get to see her very often. She started to get a push last year on SmackDown. Remember those cool vignettes that she got? She was the protector, and then she wasn't. She's been stuck on main event. She actually showed up on Raw tonight. She walked up to Becky Lynch, 
Zaya asked her, what about me? What about Raven? She said, what? When will it be my turn? And Becky said, look, I'm not a hard woman to find. And she walked away, and Zaya said that she would find. Look, everyone, it's Samoa Bro. Zachariah, thank you for the Samoa Bro. You know it's a Triple H show. You know it is a Triple H influence show when we get a Zaya Lee appearance on the television program. I mean, that says it all right there. Drew McIntyre against J.D. McDonough. This did not go very long. McIntyre no sold a few chops, launched him high in the air with a back body drop. There was a distraction by Dominic that allowed McDonough to chop block Mac, uh, McIntyre and take over for a little bit. McIntyre uh, got sent into the post by Dominic when the referee got distracted. And Dominic tried to interfere again. Drew shoved him into the announce desk. In the ring, McIntyre gave McDonough a future shock DDT and a Claymore for the win. McIntyre had to go over strong here, right? He's the one challenging for the world title at Crown Jewel. J.D. McDonough has been a punching bag so far, so he had to go over strong. He had to go over quickly. Uh, they did show Damian Priest watching in the back, looking displeased with J.D. McDonough over this loss, and Rhea Ripley told him, I have an idea. Now, earlier today, Wade Barrett had a chance to sit down with Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa after the outcome. We saw the outcome of the main event, the close of Raw last week, where Champa was being overwhelmed by Imperium. And Johnny Gargano, his first appearance in months, came out to make the save. They did not go back, by the way. You know, back in the day, Vince McMahon would tell us that uh, if, if we went off the air with Monday Night Raw, they would show us the conclusion of this match the following week. Now that I think about it, I'm not sure they ever actually did show us the conclusion of any match that got cut off. But the end of the show got cut off last week. So we did not get to see Gargano and Ciampa hit their meeting in the middle finish. I think it was to uh, Giovanni Vinci. But that's how the show went off the air last week. We got our, our DIY reunion. So they were sitting in the locker room, and Ciampa said the DIY was always bigger than, than us. He said the fans made us former NXT Tag Team Champions, first team to headline a takeover. Gargano thought that everything happened for a reason. And this was finally going to be their moment. But then, out of nowhere, Gargano eats a boot. And it's Imperium. They ambush them. And Giovanni Vinci and Ludwig Kaiser left them both lame. So they are setting up a program here involving Imperium and DIY. And I am just... And this is yet another example of Triple H's influence on the show. His growing influence again with Monday Night Raw. If this was a Vince McMahon run show in the way that for months this year, it has felt like it is very much an influenced show by Vince McMahon, then Johnny Gargano wouldn't even be on the show. We would not be getting a DIY re reunion. We might get Champa on the show. I think Champa was, was, he was on the show, right? That was when he was with The Miz back before the Vince scandals blew up last year. But we would not have this DIY reunion. This here is all Triple H. Because Vince McMahon doesn't give a shit about DIY or The Way or any of the stuff that they were doing in NXT. So right off the bat, we know exactly who is responsible for this. I am glad that they have put these two finally together on the main roster. DIY against Imperium is going to be very good. The prospect of doing DIY against Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn very appealing to me because I think that would be a fantastic match and a fantastic way to really introduce this audience to what these two are capable of. Because the fact is, the fans are not invested right now. They're not really all that invested in Champa. They're not really invested at all in Johnny Gargano. And, and even before he was missing for months. I, I know he's been gone, obviously, but even before that. So what is missing? What is missing? There's some people who don't like Johnny Gargano. He's too short. He's vanilla. He's an indie darling and all this other garbage. How do you get the fans behind Johnny Gargano? What is it that made him popular with the NXT audience? His ring work. You know, he, he can be a, a funny character, like a comedy character on the show. He was doing some comedy in NXT. 
But it's his work that got him over as the underdog babyface. There was no better underdog babyface in the company at that time during the black and gold era in the entire company than Johnny Gargano. Yeah, this is after Daniel Bryan had his underdog run, you know, nine, nine or ten years ago. Johnny Gargano got over on the merits of his work. He and Champa together were a fantastic team. They had fantastic matches with American Alpha and the Revival. And they even had matches against each other that were classics in NXT. If you can get them in the ring with people like Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn and Cody Rhodes and Jay Uso, if they can work their way up, because it'll take time. They don't belong in the ring with those guys just yet. You know, the, the, the Cody's and the Jay Uso's. But if you give them a chance to establish themselves on the main roster and work their way up the ladder and let their work speak for them speak for itself, I do think that they will get over. I think the audience will gravitate towards them. But you've got to start somewhere. So these guys are starting from the bottom and they're going to have a chance to work their way up. Under Vince McMahon, they simply would not have had that opportunity. Give them the chance. If they fail, they fail. But I think that Johnny Gargano can get over as an underdog babyface on this show. And Tommaso Ciampa can be a great heel one day. He was a great heel in NXT. There's no reason that the things that got them to the dance on the black and gold cannot be replicated on the main roster. I would wager that the majority of the people who watched this show or that were in that building tonight, I don't know, I don't were they in Omaha? Where were they tonight? Omaha. I will wager that the vast majority of those people did not see Johnny Gargano or Tommaso Ciampa during their prime run in NXT. They don't know them. We have to be reintroduced to these people. You can't debut them on TV and then pull them or they get hurt and they disappear and then expect that people are going to give them a big pop. I saw people last week saying, oh yeah, big pop for Johnny Gargano running out there at the end of the show. What did you expect? He wasn't over before he got hurt and was taken off TV. So this is a good starting point. I've always said, start them as a team, and then eventually you can split them off and they can get singles runs. But the sum of their parts together, together, is how you start them out. Now, they aired a Tegan Knox video package, including her talking about her first ACL tear. She, she actually tore her ACL right after she started training and signed with WWE. And then a year later, it was in the May Young Classic, she was wrestling Rhea Ripley, and her other knee exploded. It wasn't just an ACL tear. I mean, she tore her ACL, I think her MCL, her PCL, her ABC, her NWO. I mean, she tore everything in her knee. Her knee basically exploded. And she said that she's just lucky to be here. And she will never stop fighting. Come back live at the gorilla position. Now she's being interviewed by uh, Jackie Redman. And she said that Becky is going to be fighting the best version of Tegan Knox, And she would show the world who she was. Natty showed up. She encouraged Tegan to show Becky what she was made of. Elsewhere, Ricochet was in a mood. And he was on the warpath. And he was looking for Shinsuke Nakamura. Adam Pierce informed him that they had uh, Nakamura escorted out of the building. However, Ricochet would be able to get his hands on him next week in a false count anywhere match, and Ricochet was very pleased with this. Now, if you paid attention, while this was going on in the background, and again, I feel like this is something we saw more of when Triple H initially took over, you would see a lot of these little Easter eggs. If you paid attention to the backstage segments, there was always something going on in the background. And sometimes it might lead somewhere, somewhere, sometimes maybe it didn't. In the background, Rhea Ripley was having a conversation with Drew McIntyre. McIntyre was sitting on, I think, an equipment case, just lounging out, and they were having a conversation. This ties back into what Rhea said earlier when she told Priest, I have an idea. What that idea is? Well, I don't know, although there was a segment later on that might give us a, a clue as to what you know it might have been about. We had Becky Lynch one-on-one -on -one with Tegan Knox for the NXT Women's Championship. The NXT push continues because they are trying to get money. They want as much money as they can get on their next television rights deal. So the more they can build up NXT, 
the more money they'll make. So we have Becky Lynch defending the NXT title here on Raw. We've got the whole show loaded up. It's like NXT WrestleMania tomorrow night. That's why they've been doing this. So the title was on the line here. Becky missed a dive off the apron. She collided with the barricade. After a break, Becky fired back with strikes, hit an exploder. Tegan came back with a flying crossbody. She tried for her shiniest wizard, but Becky ducked and went for an armbar. Tegan blocked it, drove Becky into the turnbuckle, and then she applied an armbar to Becky's injured arm. But Becky escaped. She responded with a missile drop kick for two. Tegan caught her off the ropes and hit a fallaway slam into a cover, only got a near fall. So Tegan tried a crucifix pin for two. Lynch kicked out, and she kicked out, and she turned it into a disarm her. And Tegan was struggling to fight out of it, but in the end, she tapped out. Becky Lynch retains the women's championship. After the match was over, Tegan got up, and the two of them bumped fists. And as Becky left the ring, the camera was right there. She knew the camera was on her, and she just repeatedly over and over again kept saying into the camera, Buy my book! Buy my book! She would have fit right in with the NWO back then. Buy, buy the shirt. Buy the shirt, buy the book, buy the whole thing. The crowd was very quiet for this match. They were deathly quiet. Because again, Tegan Knox is not a known commodity to these people. They have to establish her on TV. Triple H is now hopefully taking steps to do that. It takes time. Can't create stars in one day. But this was a reintroduction of her, effectively. A reintroduction. And the fact that she was competitive with Becky. This was not a squash. This was a competitive match. Becky had to work. She had to fight. The, the outcome was never in doubt. But it was a good showing for Tegan. Now she has to build on that. And the only way you build on that is by getting consistent television. I've said the same thing about AEW. And people who show up one week and then we don't see them again. Like Tony Khan forgets that they even exist. Consistency is key. Backstage, Adam Pierce informed Candice LeRae and Indy Hartwell that Johnny Gargano was all banged up but not seriously hurt. He was still waiting on word about Champa. Rhea Ripley showed up and she told uh, LeRae and Hartwell to get out. They were not about to uh, listen to her, but Adam Pierce asked them nicely to leave, so they did. And Ripley demanded a match with Shayna Baszler on Raw next week. Which, what Rhea wants, Rhea gets. So the match has since been made official. Natty approached Tegan Knox in the back and told her, You did amazing. You did amazing. Here's your participation trophy. You did great. No, you lost. You lost. So she's trying to build up her confidence here. Tegan was pissed that she lost, as she should be. Katana Chance and Caden Carter. Two more faces that we haven't seen in forever. Isn't it kind of funny that all these people we haven't seen suddenly show up on the same show? So they pop up here. They were offering some positive feedback to Tegan Knox. And Carter wanted them to go for a drink. They should just go to Cody's bus. Chelsea Green and Piper Niven showed up, and Chelsea was mocking them for having a pity party. She told Natty not to get involved in her business, and Natty got in her face, so Piper Niven got in her face and challenged Natty to a match next week on Raw, which she promptly accepted. They aired a Ludwig Kaiser video package. Not an Imperium video package. This was a Ludwig Kaiser video package. He said he doesn't compare himself to other superstars. His competition are famous works of art, which they were showing on screen. He said that he is living art. And Kaiser uh, said that he is European elegance and an A-plus specimen. Hey, the more they do with Kaiser, the better. Kaiser is very good. But it came off like a vignette for a single star at a time when he and Vinci are partners and about to enter into a program with DIY. So it was a little odd. But again, Triple H is someone who we have seen. It's one of his calling cards where we get a lot of these types of hype packages for people, whether they're about to make their debut or even just a random hype package to, to promote somebody who's already on the show. If they want to promote Ludwig Kaiser, 
harder, that's great. It's just weird that it was Kaiser and not Imperium. The main event was Cody Rhodes and Jey Uso defending the undisputed tag team championship against Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens. Owens had what, if you paid attention, I think it was on his left, uh, the left side of his shorts, what looked like the PWG logo. Uh, like the gorilla was on there, and it had the word fight underneath the gorilla. Cody and Sammy started out normally enough until they started chopping each other. Sammy got annoyed. He shoved Cody, so Cody shoved him back. Jay and KO, they hit the ring, and they all argued as they went to break 90 seconds into the match. So tempers flaring here at the beginning of this match. Tensions were already flaring up. Jay tagged himself in after a break. And he circled Sammy. The two of them were in the ring together at the same time. Finally, they went at it. Jay got the better of things, so KO tagged in. Owens and Jay, they hammered away at each other and spilled outside. Cody tried to get involved. So Sammy went after him, and they all started brawling wildly. And they tried to separate all of them. And just when things looked like they were calming down, Owens tackled Jay over the announce desk. And then Cody and Sammy went at it again. And we went to another commercial break. Owens hit Jay with a senton bomb for two. He and Jay exchanged super kicks. Jay hit back-to-back -back super kicks. How many super kicks do you think the Young Bucks will hit in a given month compared to the Usos when the Usos were working together? Frankly, even if you want to take them individually. Because I lose count in these matches of how many. I mean, it's, it's, it's comical. It is absolutely comical. And the Bucks, I blame the Bucks for this. The Bucks are responsible for this. But now it's just everybody does it. But really, the Usos and the, and the Bucks are the worst offenders of just completely bastardizing the super kick. I know they're not the only ones who do it, but they're the ones who do it the most. I'm just wondering who does it more. Who relies on that move more? Is it Matt and Nick? Is it Jimmy and Jay? I don't know. We got a bazillion super kicks here in this match. Owens, though, dropped him with a clothesline. Cody and Sammy tagged in. Cody hit a power slam and a Cody cutter for two. They countered each other's big moves until Sammy hit a blue thunder bomb. Only got a two count. Sammy then hit an exploder in the corner, and he was setting up for the Haluva kick. When Cody busted out of the corner, he hit a crossroads. Owens broke up the cover when he went for the pin. Cody was setting up for a pedigree, but Sammy back body dropped his way out of it, and they both tagged out. So now we have Owens, and we have Jay Uso. Jay hit, what else? A super kick. Got a two count out of it. Owens avoided an Uso splash and hit a stunner, and he looked like he had the match won, but Cody broke up the pin. It's HBK's fault. I didn't see HBK throwing too many super kicks in his matches. He threw one, except that one match with Sid. He hit three. But usually he hit one. Shawn Michaels, poor Shawn Michaels, his, his, his poor finish. So Sammy wiped out both opponents with a flip dive out to the floor. Owens tried another senton bomb. Jay, though, got his knees up. Jay hit Owens and Zayn with super kicks. <laughs> just ridiculous. It's just absolutely ridiculous. Can you imagine the Bucks? against the Usos or the Bucks of the Usos in, in like an eight-man tag on the same side, would we see anything other than super kicks? Can you, I mean, you talk about super kick overload. We're never going to get it, but the Bucks against the Usos, it would be ridiculous. So Cody laid out Sammy with another crossroads, and then Jay and Cody, they gave Owens their new combo 1D slash Cody Cutter finish. And Jay pinned Owens to retain the titles. This was a very scary landing on the Cody Cutter. Because Cody, as he came backwards, I mean, he folded himself up. I mean, like if he was taking a German suplex. If he went to Suplex City with Brock Lesnar, that's how he landed. And they showed two replays of it, including a slow-mo. And it looked like Cody knocked himself silly. But uh, very good main event. Uh, not great, but a very good main event. After it was over, Cody wanted a handshake from Sammy, and there was a little bit of hesitation there, but Sammy did ultimately, you know, he, he acquiesced and he gave him the handshake. Owens was outside the ring watching this, so he sees the handshake. He gets back into the ring, and he goes over to Cody, and he shakes hands with Cody. 
Then he went face to face with Jay. What's he going to do? Surprisingly, he shook his hand and he gave him a hug. And then he picked up, he or he grabbed his arm, and he raised Jay's arm into the air, and that is how they went off the air. I thought for a moment there we're getting a Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens heel, or at least a Kevin Owens heel thing. I didn't know what he was about to do, but it didn't feel good. And then he surprised me by giving the guy a hug and raising his arm like a good sport. So no heel turn. You know, I guess you got to save that for, for Drew McIntyre, right? You don't want to turn too many people at once here. They need baby faces. I still think McIntyre is going to end up on the heel side of the column on this show. So now here's the question that I pose. Does the bloodline get involved in the main event next week? Because now it's going to be Cody and Jay defending the titles in a rematch against the Judgment Day. Now, we didn't see anything at Fastlane, anything that had anything to do with this new alliance between the bloodline and the Judgment Day. We saw Rhea Ripley and Paul Heyman shake hands on it on SmackDown Friday night, and then the next night, nothing. Nothing. They didn't try to help each other, nothing. But... They still shook on it. There's a partnership. There's an understanding between the two factions. I don't see Cody and Jay holding these belts for very long. I don't see the purpose in them holding these belts for more than a few weeks, if that. So do we see the bloodline show up next week and provide the assist to the Judgment Day and they regain the tag team titles? I think so. I think so. I think that's, I think that's where this may be headed next week. But this was one of the best Raw shows of the entire year. I don't want to say that it was the best, but this was one of the more enjoyable Raw shows of the entire year. It was not perfect, uh, but there were really no segments that were bad. There were really no segments that bored me. Again, even the Nia Jax match, it was relatively short and inoffensive. Uh, they moved a bunch of stories along. They even reintroduced a bunch of faces that we haven't seen in a while. It really feels like we are pushing the reset button in many ways on this show. And we are starting as we did from August of 2022. We're kind of starting over again. We're putting a new coat of paint on things, and we're going to try to get some new faces involved, and we'll see who gets over and who doesn't. Uh, the triple threat for the IC title shot was really good. Uh, they put Bronson Reed over strong to set up a huge match for next week. And they gave away a big main event. I'm surprised they gave this away without at least promoting it for a week on TV or saving it for Crown Jewel. I was very surprised by that. Now, next week on the season premiere of Monday Night Raw, this is what we already have announced a week out. Priest and Balor challenging Cody and Jey Uso for the titles. Gunther and Bronson Reed for the Intercontinental title. Rhea Ripley against Shayna Baszler, non-title. Ricochet against Shinsuke Nakamura, false count anywhere. And Natalia against Piper Niven. Already announced, seven days out. I, you know, remember those old episodes of Beavis and Butthead? There were, there were some episodes where they would be in class. There was one in particular, one episode where they were in class with uh, Coach Buzzcut. And they were not allowed to laugh. And he was teaching them about sex education. And he's saying, today we're going to learn about the penis. We're going to learn about the vagina. And he's going, and, and Butthead is turning red. He's biting his lip. He is doing everything in his power not to bust a gut laughing. That is how I picture Vince McMahon sitting at home looking at these matches. He's looking at this card. He's looking at some of these people's names. He is turning red. He is biting his lip. He is going to, he's trying everything in his power not to mess and meddle with the show next week and mess with the script and bump this and let's do this and not do that. It's going to take every fiber of this man's being to not stick his nose and blow this show up before we get to next Monday. If we get to next Monday and all five of these matches happen as they're advertised, then you'll know that there's a real change going on here. That's how you'll know. Here's the Twitter poll. How would you grade Raw for October 9th? 80% thumbs up. 19, actually just shy of 20. 20% thumbs down for Raw tonight. That is the highest thumbs up total for this show in months. I cannot remember the last time we had an 80% thumbs up score for Monday Night Raw. 
There is reason to be hopeful. Let us hope it continues. Let's hope. Because if they can be more like the show tonight, this show would be a hell of a lot more tolerable than it's been in the past. Even though it's still an hour too long. I will die on that hill. There is no wrestling show that needs to be three hours every week. Lady Fire Panda. Drop it a $20 talking about here we had a little disconnect hey look at that we're back my Wi-Fi dropped but we're back just in time for your super chats we're back fire panda says uh, look everyone it's Samoa bro since Samoa bro is a super chat uh, I think you have to give us a he's fat super chat please and thank you with the cherry on top Hashtag go Mets. Yes, the Mets are going. The Mets are going home for the postseason. They're going back home to prepare for next season because that is the motto of the Mets. you got to believe, right? There's always next time. That should be the Mets' motto. There's always next time. Uh, Brother Fluff Salisbury. Rank these, go F yourselves. Ron Burgundy, Christian Cage, and Spider Spider from Goodfellas. Uh, Christian Cage, Spider, and Ron. There you go. Bobby's World, of all the NXT call-ups, I cry for Shinsuke the least. How many shots did he get a world title like? Nine? I like him, but I just don't think his style translated well to the main roster. Uh, the real CS02. Apparently, Vince McMahon is out again for now. Until another six months pass, and he gets control back. Until he's gone, he's never going to go away. Oh, he'll always, he'll always be. As long as there's breath coming out of his lungs, he'll always be lurking in the shadow. Dr. Bropio, WWE and AEW presents Over the Edge. How many Over the Edges were there? I'm pretty sure 99 was the last one. But I think 98 was, was there only two of them, right? There was one in 98, and then the last one in 99. Uh, Hype Man Slimy, which is your favorite lie that Hulk Hogan has ever told? Also, who is one wrestler in WWE that you would want to see turn heel? Uh, besides Drew. Uh, one wrestler that I would like to see turn heel? I'm trying to think who the top baby faces at the moment on Raw and SmackDown, right? SmackDown, we have LA Knight. You want an answer? John Cena. Does John Cena count? It's not going to happen. John Cena. missed. He missed his opening. He missed the right time to do it. But man, that would have been something. Uh, my favorite lie that Hulk Hogan... I mean, it's hard to top the one where he said he worked 400 days one year. Because of the time zone difference going back and forth to Japan so much. That, that's a hard one to top. But there's just been so many of them. You can put an encyclopedia together. You know, if anybody ever decides to do that, right? We need an author to come and write a book of all the Hogan lies and then do an audiobook version. Let me narrate the audiobook version. I would love to be the one to narrate the audiobook version of we have a professional author who wants to actually put a book together of all the Hogan lies. It would be like, who's the guy who wrote all the uh, Lord of the Rings? Um, oh God, I forgot his name. But anyway, like these large volumes, these, these huge books. You could fit all the Hogan lies into one. Groovy Goose, thank you. Love Live. This JD McDonough storyline is getting exhausting. Zero point. Keep doing what you're doing. I don't mean The Rock. Or a rock, you rock, and I just wanted you to know. Hey, thank you, Zero Point, Lady Fire Panda, Tony Khan about to announce he just got Okada to wrestle Omega tomorrow. Well, if that's the case, then we're just gonna have to watch Dynamite, and that's it. Dynam Dynamite wins for the night if he adds that to the show. Duff's vids, NXT. Oh yeah, I, I did mention to you guys. Throw those predictions out there for ratings tomorrow. He says NXT 985,000, AEW 780,000. Uh, thanks for your work, 
tomorrow in advance you rock hey duff's vids thank you those are not bad guesses Nick Grasso, Super Tuesday is looking pretty crazy with each company trying to one-up each other. Do you see any surprises like Mercedes Monet showing up to confront the women's champion or Sammy Callahan showing up to confront John Moxley? I think there's a decent chance that we'll see Mercedes confront Soraya after her match. She's out of her walking boot now. Doesn't mean that she's medically cleared yet, but she's out of her boot, so that's a good sign. Uh, Manuel fantasy booking if roman went to aew would tony khan still push him as the guy or continue to focus on building his own stars like mjf jay white etc i think he would push roman very strong but he needs to focus on his own talents and have roman work with people like mjf and with people like jay white you can do both would he give roman the kind of push he has now where he has a stranglehold on the world title and you know, nobody, he's unbeatable for, for years at a time. No, he wouldn't. Anis, AOP return. Because right now the tag division is deader than Disco. They might be returning to NXT. Not on the main roster. Adam, thank you for the five bucks. I'm glad Endeavor gave Triple H all creative control of WWE, but what would happen... If it was the other way around and they gave creative to Vince, what would happen? Let's go back and watch, you know, five years ago, WWE. There you go. You want a sense of what would happen. He's been running creative for 40 years. It's got It got progressively worse and worse and worse as time went on. It would be dog shit. That's what would happen. Uh, Rizzo, I'm not going to lie, Solo. I noticed Rhea's pigtails. I did too. That's why I mentioned it. But people were going nuts about it on Twitter. Trill Mexican 305. News just in. Triple H announced tonight on NXT. We will have war games. Tony Khan responds with dynamite. We'll have blood and guts. I'm I'm telling you, they're still going to add more, more stuff tomorrow. We're going to get even more stuff added to these shows. I don't even know when the review is going to start. They're probably going to have a 10-minute overrun each show. So I probably won't even go live until 11 o'clock. I don't know how I'm going to put all these notes together. Daniel Malcolm, thank you for the 15 bucks earlier. I appreciate that very much. Zachariah Sitchin with the 1999. Low-key Seth had some PTSD from all the sneak attacks. I'm excited I will be at Raw next Monday. But if I would have known that Roman would show up to work, I would have went to SmackDown. It is stacked but I'm cool with going to Raw. Christopher Smith, I'm wondering. No, you're wondering when Drew is going to start healing on Seth because I think Drew is going to eventually attack him and it will be wonderful. Oh, it's coming. It's coming. Amiibo Juice with the two bucks. Is Jey Uso's WWE... Is Jey Uso WWE's version of Eddie Kingston? There's only one Eddie Kingston. Quentin Hubbard. Tim Hornbaker's new book on Flair is a must read. Uh, I did not know that he did a new book on Flair. I don't even know the title. Uh, but I will have to look into that. Is it Hornbaker or Horn or Hornbacker? I'm not sure. So there you go. The uh, goal tonight was 400 likes for Be The Booker. We are at 452 after, again, one of the better Raws of the entire year. It's a good vibe, right? A good feeling, right? So we have to hope that this carries over into Be The Booker. Fingers crossed. Let's see how we do. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to Be The Booker. But first... Rizzo coming in with a $5 super chat. Brian Pillman's NXT name leaked, and it's awful. Why can't him and Braun just keep their names? Yeah, for those who don't know, apparently Brian Pillman Jr.'s new name in NXT is going to be Lexus King. 
And it is a combination of two of his sisters' names. So that's where the names come from. Lexus King. Instead of just calling him Brian Pillman Jr. because they have to own everything. All right, so here we go. Be the booker. I mean, I appreciate him, you know, using the the sisters' names and all that. I guess that that's what he came up with as being important to him, but it's a terrible name. It is a... No, it's not. It's not a good name. <laughs> it is not a good name. But it's not the name that will matter. It is what he does in the ring, and that is what I am most curious to see. Uh, here we go. We go Double J. Jeff Jarrett. Now, Jeff Jarrett is also not only wrestling for AEW, but supposedly he's helping out on the live events and the tickets end for the company. Which begs the question, what is Double J doing these days based on some of these crowds that AEW is drawing? I think he might be losing his golden touch. I thought he was he was supposedly very good at this sort of thing. I don't know what's going on there. Jeff Jarrett going to go one-on-one -on -one with Mid-South Junkyard Dog. Mid-South Junkyard Dog and Jeff Jarrett. That's old school is what that is. That's an old school wrestling match. I can get behind that. JYD during that period. And I wasn't in Louisiana during that period, but there was nobody hotter during that time than the Junkyard Dog. All right, over on the ladies' side, we begin with Gail Kim, former WWE Divas Champion and Impact Knockouts Champion. Gail Kim helped put that division on the map in Impact. It will be Gail Kim going one-on-one -on -one with Thunder Rosa. <laughs> have not heard any updates on Thunder Rosa since the last update a few weeks ago. She was having a, a practice match off camera at one of the TV tapings. And the plan was that if everything went well, she could be back in the ring soon, and then we heard nothing. So I don't know if that's a bad sign about how things went, but I have not heard anything new about her status and when she may be coming back to the ring. She's already been gone over a year. But Gail Kim and Thunder Rose would be a very good match. And now we come down to the tag teams. Doesn't it always come down to the tag teams? We begin with the Mega Maniacs. Once best friends, and now apparently not. Brings a tear to a glass eye. Hulk Hogan and Brutus the Barber Beefcake, who looks like he just stepped on a thumbtack in this photo. <laughs> the Mega Maniacs. I thought for sure they were walking out with the tag team titles at WrestleMania 9. Hogan did walk out with the title. It just wasn't the tag team titles. Hogan and Beefcake, I'll tell you what, though. Say what you want to. Hogan and Beefcake in the main event of SummerSlam 89 against Savage and Zeus. That was an awesome match. And they were both super over back then. That was probably Beefcake at his peak of his uh, popularity. Hogan and Beefcake are going to take on Chad Gable and Otis. The Alpha Academy against the Mega Maniacs. That's your main event right there. Hogan and Beefcake against Otis and Chad Gable. I want to see Chad Gable give Hulk Hogan a chaos theory. Please and thank you. That's the match you never knew you needed in your life, but aren't you disappointed you never got it? Get to see Otis selling for Hogan. Would Hogan get Otis up for the body slam? Well, not now he wouldn't. He's fucking 12, 12 back surgeries. Gable and Hogan. Amazing. Well, we went three for three. I'd call that a pretty good night. Pretty happy about that. Let's hope that it carries over into tomorrow. Tomorrow night is going to be a very busy night. Tomorrow night, we are going to be talking NXT. And we are going to be talking AEW Dynamite. And it is a loaded night for both shows. I'm going to do my best to try to watch both at the same time. And then you can come back here live. 
a little while after both shows are over, whatever time that may be, because again, they're both probably going over. And uh, we will talk about both shows. So I hope to see you all back here with me tomorrow night. I hope that you enjoyed this. Oh, my, oh, that's right. My ratings prediction. I forgot. I almost forgot. Thank you, Duffs. Uh, JM says, good morning from Denmark. He's been a Sound Off channel member for 24 months. Yeah, again, there were a bunch of memberships that expired, so we're we're way down now from where we were six months ago. But my channel members here, that's my ride or die, you guys. I appreciate it. So ratings predictions uh, for tomorrow. I'm going to go for NXT. I actually think they break a million. I think they break a million for NXT. I'm going to say, hmm, I'm going to go, yeah, I'm going to go 1.1 million for NXT. I do. I think they got Cena, they got Cody. I mean, they're teasing so many different things. I'm going to, I'm going to go 1.1 million for NXT. I could be way off base here. Dynamite, I'm going to say, boy, uh, I will, I will go. For dynamite, you know what? I'm gonna say seven hundred and ten thousand. So one point one million for NXT, seven hundred and ten thousand for AEW. I'm probably overrating NXT, but NXT is gonna win the night no matter what. So that's my prediction for tomorrow night. All that matters, though, to me is who puts on the better show. I think they're both going to be very enjoyable. Uh, Eminem in the chat says Dynamite 1.2 million, NXT 1.4 million. Well, that's not going to happen. That's not going to, they're not going to combine for almost uh, two and a half million viewers. That's number one. Number two, Dynamite has not hit a million viewers. When was the last time Dynamite hit a million overall viewers for an episode? I don't even remember it's been so long. You think the dynamite on their off night is going to draw more than what it usually like a lot more than what it usually does on Wednesdays? They they always lose viewers when they're bumped to a different night. And WWE does too. It's difficult because you're established on a certain night. When you move to another night, there are people who don't know, they forget, or that night doesn't work for them, brother, whatever the case may be. The idea of dynamite doing 1.4 million is is laughable. There's there's no way that's happening. This just, there's no way. I would be shocked. I would be shocked. But I do think NXT will cross the million mark. One thing I can tell you, it's going to be a fun night for the fans. So we, we all win. Competition, man, brings out the best and the worst, but it brings out the best. I just love the whole tit for tat thing. I, I, I just love Tony Khan tweeting multiple times during Raw tonight. Like, all right, you want, you want to screw with me? All right. I'll show you. Uh, Cameron Spencer with the 499. Unpopular opinion. Stone Cold Bret Hart Mania match was a snore fest and it sucked. I don't know anyone who agrees with me. Do you agree? Absolutely not. I have no idea what match you were watching. To me, it is, if not the best, it is one of the best matches in WWE history. Not just WrestleMania history. It is, it is such an important match, but it's just overall just a great match. And, and then you add in the significance of that match, and it's just legendary. So, no, you are definitely in the minority on that one. Uh, and Devin from NJ, in an interview back in 2011, CM Punk said that Austin was a bigger star than Hulk Hogan by a landslide. Do you agree that it is a landslide? No, it is not a landslide. It is not a landslide, but I have said that at his at his peak, when Austin was just white hot and they were selling out buildings and selling so many of those Austin 316 shirts, the the level of popularity that he was able to reach in wrestling, uh, and even in the mainstream as well, you could throw the NWO in there too. Um was as big as anybody I've ever seen. 
But to say that Austin was a way bigger star in wrestling than Hogan by a landslide, that's just, you're just exaggerating. I, I would not say by a landslide. I mean, to say that, I think, and Punk should know better because he's old enough and he was a wrestling fan, but to me, I hear something like that and it just makes me think, okay, you didn't live through that era, so... You didn't live through the whole Hulkamania period, the expansion, the boom period of the golden era, 90s. Well, not 90s, but uh, mid to late 80s. And and Punk did. So, I don't know. He may maybe just doesn't like Hogan. And maybe he's just biased and he's a big Stone Cold fan. But I don't think you can say that uh, it was a landslide. That would not be accurate. All right, I'm going to get out of here. Thank you guys for hanging out with me on a Monday night. I hope this was as fruitful for you as it was for me. We'll do it all over again tomorrow night. It's going to be chaos. I love it. Let's watch it burn. I'll see you tomorrow night.